We will wait some seconds till you take a seat. Thank you very much. And the next uh, paper is the one on reutilization of Roman amphorae, whose speaker is Ted Peña from, from Berkeley, and whose discussion is Miguel Angel Cao from Barcelona. So you have the word. Thank you very much. Well, I couldn't agree more with uh, André Chernia about uh, how bad it is uh, that Anglo-Saxon has taken over everything in Europe. So as a form of protest, I'm going to speak in American. No obstante, mis antepasados mexicanos. Okay. In this paper, I present a general overview of the practice of reusing transport amphoras as packaging containers in the Roman world. After first discussing, archaeological, uh, first discussing various background considerations, I review the archaeological evidence for this practice, consider three significant questions that it raises, and then conclude by commenting how we might improve our understanding of the nature and significance of this practice also briefly noting a program of research that a team under my direction will undertake in the near future that may elucidate some aspects of this practice. In my 2007 book, Roman Pottery and the Archaeological Record, I recognized three kinds of reuse associated with Roman pottery, labeling these types A, B, and C, and defining them as follows. Type A, reuse involving an application similar to that of the vessel's prime use application, that is, its initially intended use without any physical modification to it. Type B, reuse involving an application different from the vessel's prime use application without any physical modification to it. Type C, reuse involving an application different from the vessel's prime use application involving physical modification of the vessel. Type A reuse, in effect, relates exclusively to amphoras involving their reuse as a packaging container for some substance after having been emptied of their initial content. It is the form of reuse most relevant to the theme of this conference, and I will today focus exclusively on it. To begin, I must indicate two simplifying assumptions, I que subrayar, simplifying, that I will make in my exposition. One, amphoras were normally manufactured for the purpose of packaging, of the packaging of substances. In the vast majority of cases, foodstuffs, that is, for their distribution beyond the local level and not to serve simply as storage jars or as containers for the local distribution of substances. And two, and this gets to many points raised by Professor Beltran, which I'll skip over, each class of amphora was normally employed for the packaging of a single specific substance, most, most often wine, oil, or some sort of processed fish product, which I term that class's principal content, with any other substance packaged in that class to be identified as an irregular content. I accordingly regard the reuse of an amphora as a packaging container, as an instance of type A reuse, and its reuse as a storage jar or for local transfers, an instance of type B reuse. I here term the initial use of an amphora its prime use with its content, its prime use content, and any subsequent use, its reuse with its content, in this case, its reuse content. While it is frequently difficult to distinguish between the type A reuse and the type B reuse of an amphora, this distinction is worth making in that it embodies significant behavioral considerations. Specifically, we can imagine that type B reuse often involved the casual collection of small numbers of used containers and their eventual transfer after refilling to a locale at no great distance from the place where they had been emptied of their prime use content with possession and ownership of the refilled vessels frequently remaining unchanged. In contrast, we can imagine that type A reuse often involved the organized collection of large numbers of used containers and their eventual transfer after refilling to a locale a substantial distance from the place where they had been emptied of their prime use content, with possession and ownership of the refilled vessels often changing one or more times. 
The type A reuse of amphoras has significant implications for our efforts to employ the amphora evidence to document the, dis document the distribution and consumption of the foodstuffs regularly packaged in amphoras. Most importantly, if it can be demonstrated that amphoras were regularly reused as packaging containers in certain times, places, and contexts, we will need to reconsider the assumption that the presence of an amphora at a site represents the distribution to and consumption there of an amount of that class's principal content roughly equal to the vessel's capacity. The type A reuse of amphoras might have occurred in the context of the distribution and sale of foodstuffs on the market, the mobilization of foodstuffs for a state or ecclesiastical supply initiative, or the distribution of foodstuffs in the context of elite self-supply. Beyond considerations of shape, size, and weight, the suitability of an amphora for reuse as a packaging container would have been conditioned by three factors. The extent to which its opening and emptying in the context of its prime use had involved damage that might have limited its suitability for reuse, the presence of a pitch lining, which might have limited its utility for the packaging of certain foodstuffs, and the presence of remains of its prime use context, content, which again might have served to limit its suitability for the packaging of certain foodstuffs. The reuse of amphoras as packaging containers presumably involved the acquisition of substantial numbers of containers that have been emptied of their content, either prime use or reuse, followed by their reconditioning. This would have involved their cleaning to remove remains of their prior content. In some cases, perhaps, their reworking to repair damage and their pitching or repitching, and perhaps also the, rem the removal of titulae picti or other labels referring to their antecedent use. It was presumably advantageous if the vessels belonged to a single class, as this would have simplified reconditioning and filling operations, while perhaps also limiting questions that might have arisen regarding the amount, identity, or quality of the vessel's reuse content, and simplifying also the mechanics of their storage and transport. These considerations suggest that certain classes of amphoras would have been uh, more or less suitable for reuse as packaging containers, and that the reuse of amphoras as packaging containers would have been more or less practical and economical in particular places and particular times as a function of their availability. Where this was a regular practice, we may conjecture that it was facilitated by some sort of regular mechanism for the provision of used containers to those who wish to employ them. Specifically, there may have been brokers specializing in the collection, reconditioning, and delivery of used amphoras. The certain or possible markers of either type A or type B reuse of an individual amphora include the following. One, multiple titulae picti that indicate two or more instances of filling. Two, damage that suggests two or more instances of stoppering or opening. Three, content remains indicating two or more different contents or the presence of a pitch lining and content remains incompatible with this. Four, a titulus pictus or content remains indicating an irregular content or a content originating somewhere far away from the container's point of origin. And five, and my apologies for what must be the world's worst slide, I'm waiting to get a better copy from my friend Roberta Tomber. Um, uh, Stoppering involving a method that differs from the standard method or with materials originating somewhere far from the container's point of origin. Generally speaking, it is only when we can document large numbers of reused amphoras in a context linked to extra-local distribution, such as among the cargo of a sunken merchant ship or in storage at a bottling or a warehouse facility, that we can feel reasonably certain that we are in the presence of type A reuse. To my knowledge, there are, in fact, very few instances in which amphoras have been recovered in contexts that point unequivocally to type A reuse. The most compelling of these is, of course, the grotto wreck, the remains of a merchantman that sank near the head of the Adriatic during the middle decades of the second century AD. At least circa 600 amphoras belonging to four different classes were documented among the ship's cargo including circa 200 African ones, oil containers from Tunisia, circa 20 Tripolitanian ones, oil containers from Tripolitania, 
at least circa 150 Kennesaw 19s, wine containers from the Aegean, and an unspecified number, perhaps around 200 Grotto ones, fish products containers from the upper Adriatic. The analysis of macro remains revealed that the African ones in Kennesaw 19s contained one variety of fish product, while the Tripolitanian ones contained a different variety of fish product. All three classes were stoppered with circular sherds cut from these same three classes. The Grotto ones, in contrast, contain no macro remains of their content, a fact, a fact compatible with Tichili Picti indicating a content of liquamen. The contents of all four classes presumably originated somewhere around the head of the Adriatic, an important center for the confection of fish products. The Grotto ones were likely the only prime use containers among the ship's cargo, with the other three classes consisting of reused containers. The fact that the distribution of the Grado I is limited to northeastern Italy and the Balkans suggests that the ship had sailed from a port somewhere in the upper Adriatic and was probably bound for a port somewhere else in this same region. Another possible case comes from the Calaquilip IV wreck, the remains of a small merchantman that sank off the coast of northeastern Spain in the AD 60s or 80s. I'm not interested in debating a specific date if people out there are provoked by that. The ship was carrying at least 76 Dressel 20s, oil containers from southern Spain. Most were closed with ill-fitting stoppers cut from sherds rather than the purpose-made opercula commonly associated with this class, raising the possibility that they had been stoppered on more than one occasion. The ship appears to have been engaged in cabotage trading along the coast of Spain and France between Cadiz and Narbonne. A high degree of heterogeneity and Narbonne. A high degree of heterogeneity among sets of amphors recovered among the cargo of a wreck may also be an indicator of type A reuse. This may be attested in one or more of several different attributes, including amphora class, details of vessel morphology or manufacturing technique, fabric, or epigraphy. The Cabrera III wreck, the remains of a merchantman that sank off Cabrera, one of the Balearic Islands, circa AD 260, provides a good example of this. Of the 131 amphoras recovered, 124, representing six different classes, likely belong to the ship's cargo. These included 34 Dressel 20s and 16 Dressel 23s, both oil containers from southern Spain, 19 Almagro 50s, 16 Almagro 51Cs, and seven Beltran 72s, all fish products containers from Portugal, and 32 African twos, fish products containers from Tunisia. These last show a strikingly high degree of heterogeneity. They included examples of three different variants, the 2A, 2C, and 2D, manufactured in at least two different fabrics. 13 bore a stamp, each produced with a different dye and representing at least 10 and as many as 13 different stamping entities. All bore a pitch lining compatible with the content of fish products. While two contained the remains of fish products, another two contained a, number, a large number of olive pits. The Portuguese containers represent a strong contrast, showing a notably high degree of homogeneity. 17 of the Almagro 50s bore a maker's stamp, with these produced using just four different dyes representing two different workshops, while three of the seven Beltran 72s bore a maker's mark, with these all produced using the same dye as that employed to stamp one of the Almagro 50s. The arrangement of the amphoras in the ship's hold suggests that they were all brought aboard in a single episode. The location of the wreck and the points of origin of its cargo suggested it sank during a voyage from Spain to Italy, most likely from our current location, Cadiz, bound for Ostia Portis. The sets of Tunisian and Portuguese amphors recovered at this wreck clearly had quite different histories before being brought aboard, with the former subject to a complex set of operations that brought together containers manufactured and presumably initially filled at many different locations, and the latter a relatively simple set of operations that saw sets of containers originating and presumably initially filled at the same locus remaining together. While it cannot be excluded that the Tunisian amphoras were prime use containers bound for Italy in the context of some sort of triangular trade, 
A more plausible interpretation is that they were containers initially shipped from Tunisia to Spain, where they were emptied of their content and then reused as packaging containers for local fish products and olives. Turning now to terrestrial sites, three facilities that serve for the confection and or distribution of foodstuffs at Pompeii provide evidence for the systematic collection of large numbers of amphoras following their emptying of their contents, presumably for some kind of type A or type B reuse. These include the Casa del Vinario at 996-7, and the Casa di Quintus Mestrius Maximus Lupinar of Amaranthus complex at 1911 through 12, both connected with the distribution of wine, and the Officina del Garam de Imbrizzi, 1129, connected with the confection and distribution of fish products and probably other foodstuffs. This last has recently been subject to a detailed investigation by the Proyecto Pesca y Garam in Pompeya y Ercolano, about which we will doubtless hear at this conference, which documented the systematic sorting and separate storage of different classes of amphoras associated with different prime use contents. Of particularly great interest, however, is the evidence from Villa B at Oplontis on the outskirts of Pompeii. This structure, a Horia-like building located just a few meters from the shore, served as a facility for the packaging and storage of foodstuffs. The ground floor peristyle contained over 400 empty amphoras, mostly dressel two to fours, stored in inverted position. This facility evidently served for the large-scale bottling of wine. Large numbers of local and regional wine amphoras, mostly or in every case used, were assembled here and placed in storage with some or all of these pitched or repitched. Wine also was brought here, presumably in large measure local Vesuvian wine transported in wagon mounted culei. The wine was transvased into the amphoras, a significant portion of which were then presumably loaded aboard ships for extra local distribution. Since 2012, a team from the University of Texas has been carrying out a program of investigation at Villa B, which includes the study of these amphoras. As part of this work, they have carried out residue analysis of a small subset of these containers, the results of which will be presented at this conference in a poster representing work that was directed by Alessandra Pecci. We may now turn to consideration of three questions raised by the type A reuse of amphoras. The first is the extent to which the employment of used amphoras for the packaging of foodstuffs would have represented an advantage of some sort. In terms of cost, this practice would not appear to have offered much advantage. The Heroninus archive, a set of papyrus documents pertaining to the management of an estate in Egypt during the AD 250s, shows, for example, that amphoras wholesaled for between 0.5 and 1.3% of the wholesale cost of the wine packaged in them. Similarly, the Edictum de Pretiis, issued in AD 301, sets the price for a Lagona with capacity of one half amphora at a figure equal to between 1.67 and 6.25% uh, of the price of one half amphora of various grades of wine. With regard to convenience, it is not clear that it would have been more convenient for an establishment that required containers for the packaging of some foodstuff to meet this by gathering used containers through its own efforts or by purchasing these from a broker than it would have been to obtain new amphoras from one or more potters. Indeed, the acquisition of new amphoras might have offered considerable advantages since the establishment could have contracted for the delivery of the exact number of containers that it required in specific sizes rather than having to settle for what happened to be available on the second-hand market. These considerations suggest that the type A reuse of amphoras would have been limited largely to situations in which an establishment wound up with large numbers of empty amphoras that it could employ for such a person per purpose, or situations in which the supply of new amphoras was inadequate to meet demand due to some interruption of the supply chain, a sudden and unexpected increase in the production of the substances that required packaging, or the absence of a local pottery industry capable of manufacturing a sufficient number of suitable containers. The second question is the extent to which the presence of remains of an amphora's prime use content or a pitch lining would have rendered a container unsuitable for use for the packaging of some substances. 
The evidence from Plantas Villa B indicates that amphoras used for the packaging of wine could be reused for this same purpose. On the other hand, containers that had been used for the pack packaging of fish products likely would not have been regarded as suitable for the packaging of wine, given the likelihood that residues would have promoted the wine's acetic fermentation or affected its taste. The evidence from the Grado Rec indicates that amphoras employed for the packaging of wine, oil, and fish products could be reused for the packaging of fish products. The evidence from Calocolip 4 suggests that olive oil amphoras could be reused for the packaging of some sort of food stuff, most likely olive oil. Finally, while recent research suggests that this position needs to be nuanced somewhat, Olive oil breaks down pitch, so scholars generally assume that pitched wine and fish products containers would not have been reused for the packaging of olive oil. The third and final question regards the extent to which the reuse of amphoras as packaging containers might have raised problems regarding the identification of the container's contents. The papyrological evidence, which I can't discuss in detail here, makes clear that in Roman Egypt, people regularly referred to many different kinds of amphoras by specific names, most often an adjective indicating the, containers, the container type's assumed place of origin. Interesting in this regard is a passage in Pliny the Elder in which he states that when packaged in lagoni, that is, small flat-bottomed amphoras, tauromenitanum, uh, the wine from tauromenium, was often passed off as mamertinum, the wine from Masana, immediately to the north. This suggests that some individuals, perhaps consumers at Rome, tended to associate this form of container with Mamertinum, presumably a wine thought superior to Tauromenitanum, and that unscrupulous sellers, presumably retailers at Rome, took advantage of this by selling inferior wine to incautious buyers at an elevated price. On the basis of, this evidence, on the basis of evidence like this, scholars have generally inferred that individuals across the empire were not only able to recognize a wide array of amphoras, but also associated some of these with a particular kind of content. The question then is whether the reuse of amphoras as packaging containers would have caused confusion on this score, creating problems at the moment of wholesale sale, retail sale, consignment to the state or church, or the levying of customs duties. In my view, the type A reuse of amphoras need not have raised problems of this kind. Whatever people's ability to recognize different kinds of amphoras and their tendency to associate these with a particular kind of foodstuff, it was a regular practice to provide an amphora with a titulus pictus that identified its content. While it is unclear precisely how widespread this practice was, recent research in Pompeii, where the preservation of tituli picti tends to be exceptionally good, has indicated that a very large percentage of amphoras, and in some instances effectively all of those in a particular group, were provided with a titulus pictus. This suggests that it was generally thought necessary to provide some indication of its content on the exterior of a sealed amphora. If such was the case, the problem of identifying the contents of an amphora in type A reuse would not have been fundamentally different from that of an amphora in prime use, except that it would have been necessary or desirable to remove a titulus pictus referring to its prime use content in order to avoid confusion. I'm not aware of any instance in which there is evidence for the removal of a titulus pictus from an amphora with a new label executed in its place, although an operation of this kind need not have left traces that would be readily apparent. I know of two cases from Rome and four from Pompeii in which an amphora bore two tituli picti identifying different contents, thus instances in which the prime use label was not removed when a container was refilled although in none of these cases is the presence of two labels apt to have caused confusion as to the nature of the container's reuse content, for reasons I won't go into now. In cases in which amphoras were not provided with a label indicating their content, merchants, in, merchants involved in their whole, wholesale distribution might have relied on accompanying documents that indicated this. One example of such a document is TP Sulp 80, a tabella curata from Pompey's Morecine archive, probably dating to the period circa AD 26 to 61. This lists sets of amphoras being consigned by a certain Theophilus to a certain aphrodisiast that had been brought to a port in Italy, presumably Puteoli, aboard a ship known as the Octavia, indicating for each set the number and the nature of the containers and their content. I concur with Bruce Fryer's argument that by the imperial period, the wine trade, and also presumably the large-scale trade in other foodstuffs, 
had taken on the forms of what is called mature mercantilism, in which merchants understand that it is to their advantage to comport themselves in such a way as to be perceived as honest partners. It thus seems to me likely that cases of the deliberate misrepresentation of the contents of sealed amphors would have been rare at the wholesale level. Merchants regularly involved in the importing and exporting of foodstuffs would also have seen it as being in their interest to establish a reputation for honest dealing with customs officials. This might have been less the case in instances of the consignment of foodstuffs levied by the state as tax in kind or of retail sale to occasional consumers. The evidence available to us for the type A reuse of amphoras, both archaeological and textual, is scattered and it is often weak and or ambiguous in that it might reflect the type B reuse of the container. We are thus unable to determine how common this practice, how common this practice was or whether it tended to occur in certain regions, time periods, or contexts. For the present, it seems to me reasonable to assume that it was mostly limited to times and places in which there was a ready supply of used amphoras or the supply of new amphoras and possible alternative containers was insufficient to meet demand. In the current state of our knowledge, however, this practice would not appear to have been so common that we need be concerned that as distorted in significant ways, the geographical and chronological picture of the production, distribution, and consumption of the substances regularly packaged in amphoras. To conclude my presentation, I would like to suggest some ways forward in our efforts to improve our understanding of this practice. First, a systematic review of the papyrological evidence would provide us with an enhanced understanding of how and to what degree amphoras were reused for the packaging of foodstuffs in Roman Egypt. Second, the detailed characterization of amphora cargoes from additional shipwreck sites would perhaps furnish us with additional clear instances of this practice thereby providing us with more information regarding the circumstances in which it occurred and what this involved. This would also provide us with information about patterns in the homogeneity and heterogeneity of amphora cargoes, positioning us to better interpret possible evidence for this practice, such as that uh, adduced today uh, in connection with Covidetta III. Finally, it seems likely that additional programs of research aimed at identifying the remains of amphora contents will provide new information regarding practices of and patterns in the reuse of amphoras as packaging containers. In closing, I should note that starting during the summer of 2016, the Pompeii Artifact Life History Project, a research project that I direct at Pompeii, will initiate a collaboration with the University of Texas team working at Aplantis Villa B undertaking a detailed study of the set of amphoras being stored at this facility. Among our goals will be the characterization of the morphology, manufacturing techniques, fabrics, epigraphy, and use alterations of a representative subset of these containers, along with an expanded program of analysis aimed at the identification of their contents. This represents a unique opportunity to obtain a detailed picture of one apparently clear and unambiguous instance of the reuse of amphoras as packaging containers from a terrestrial site. Thank you. Thank you very much for keeping to the time um, for this so well illustrated uh, paper full of ideas and um, very nice case analysis. Now is time for the discussion. You have the word. Thank you. There you go. Good morning to everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here for me. Uh, some of you know uh, I've been out of circulation for quite a while, more than two years now. And being back on track is good. So and being surrounded by so many friends is even better. So I would like to thank, uh, I was wanting to say Dario, <laughs> Professor Bernal, <laughs> uh, Bonifé and Petship for organizing this and bringing us together. And also to Professor Peña for handling the manuscript on time so I could read your comments. Um, I will try to be brief, which is not very easy for me. And it's something very improvised. I thought that the role of the discussion was something very informal, so I didn't prepare any slides or anything like that. Uh, I read the paper and I thought it was very thoughtful, so I mostly agree with all the things that uh, were contained in that. But I have some sort of general questions that I would like to put on the table for, for, for everyone to, to, you know, to talk about it. So to, to me, packaging is very important. as. Uh, contains, protects, preserves, transports, informs, and sells. And all those things should be 
bear in mind when, when treating also reuse, right? In a particular way, packaging is a sign of identity. A logo, a color, a style might be elements with an embedded identity for the product itself. We, we normally talk about the emotional design and also the informative design. And I think that in antiquity, both these two parts were sometimes together or intimately very, very related to. So that's something important in my, in my conception of packaging. You know. if, we, if we can upset this identity of emotion and information triangle, let's say, and now for a container, it, ideally conceived for transporting one substance, should have an identity on, on its own, okay? But things get more complicated. This morning, um, the talks from <laughs> Professor Beltran, <laughs> Chernia, and the comments from Michel Bonifé has already ruined what I was <laughs> going to say, <laughs> so <laughs> they have said that, which is important because it means that we all had more or less the same ideas, so if we all agree that those are problematic issues, those are issues that probably should be in a future project if we're going to go that path, okay? So I was going to say that uh, things get more complicated and the assumption that one type of amphora, one type of content, is something that we should always question, at least. Also because I could go further up and say, uh, I could even question what class means or what type means. And this is why I believe, as Michelle was saying this morning, that we should not forget here archaeometry in terms of also inorganic uh, archaeometry, in terms of technology and provenance, because these are important issues also to define probably the content. We could have the same type of amphora with a different type of content because the provenance of that amphora is different. So th those are issues that should be always bear in mind. But even if we assume that one product, one amphora, or one type of amphora, there are things that we should be uh, asking ourselves, right? And I, I don't have any answers, to be honest. I just have more questions than answers. So why to reuse an amphora that has an embedded identity and to put another product in there? Are we trying to pretend that the product that we are filling with that amphora is something different? Is a sort of a fake product? Are we trying to pretend you know, to have something that is not what it is? That would be one, one of the questions. Are there any economic, you know, um, reasons for, for, for reusing the, this amphora? Are these reused materials maybe for an area that has something to explore but they don't have a production of amphora? We have seen, you know, some examples of, you know, in the Strait of Gibraltar or even in southeastern Spain that maybe there was a circulation of, of empty amphoras. Were those new amphoras or reused amphoras? Was, for instance, because it's a case that I know quite well, was the Balearic wine, you know, transport in a Busitan amphora? Because we don't have a Balearic um, amphora type for the Balearic wine. So those are questions that we should probably address. I was wondering, is there any indication of collection, readaptation, and transport of empty amphora at a large scale? Um, are they reused for a limited distribution? And I was wondering that it would not be worth exploring if these reuse amphora uh, had something with the need of return cargos in the, you know, in the maritime trade. Maybe those were for connection between main ports and secondary ports. It's a pity that Javier Neto, my friend, is not here, <laughs> came out with this theory of, of main ports and secondary ports. It, we could maybe explore if those, you know, reuse amphora are more for a main port with a secondary port and maybe not from a major port to another port. You have treated very well few cases that I know, you know, because I work in Grado a long time ago doing some analysis. I know Kulit well, for quite well, and I know Cabrera because it's a Balearic I mean, shipwreck, and I'm a Balearic uh, man. So I would say that Cala Kulip is, is, a, is a redistribution for Narbonne to, to the area of Catalonia. So it's a, it's a secondary, it's a you know secondary route of, of, of merchandise. So there are many questions that come to to complete what what we could talk about it. Okay, all these questions I put in, in on the table. Um, are just a few things that came to my mind reading your manuscript, okay? I was thinking that maybe when we reuse an amphora, the value of the second product is always less than the primary one. 
because otherwise we, we, we lose the identity of those outputs. And also, um, I was thinking that uh, we should bear in mind that all these questions that I have been, you know, putting here on the table are most of them already replied <laughs> by Ted Peña. Not here because of the time, but also in what I call the famous chapter five of your book, okay, which is more extended. So I'm sure you have read it already, but if, if not, it's worth rereading again this, this chapter book. So those are some uh, general you know, questions that came to my mind. In terms of more specific issues concerning the paper, um, I don't have many problems with that, but in terms of terminology, I would say that I would have preferred, for instance, to talk about primary content and secondary content instead of irregular content and, and reserve irregular when you have a substance which is not a substance, for instance, let's say Vesuvian sand or, you know, or, or sulfur or whatever. So maybe in terms of terminology, I would you know, object something about your general model, but that's something more or less that we could talk. I, I agree absolutely with the difficulties of discerning between type A and B of reuse of amphora. It's very difficult. And I think that context, that was Professor Chernia this morning talking about that this morning, I think context is fundamental. Context has been always fundamental to archaeology. So we should not forget that ever. Um, look, as we are all together, we should discuss at some point, I don't know when, the problem of pitch lining and you know, assumption of certain contents or not. Because I'm not the person to talk about organic residues. Alexandra is there, and Nicola is there, and Marshall is there. But we see more and more often pitch in lining with oil or oils. Because maybe not all that was commercialized was olive oil, but also other types of oil for you know, cosmetics or medicine or whatever. So that's another issue that we should you know, bear in mind. I'm skipping a few things, OK? Uh, just saying that you talk about two different evidence for uh, assuming the, the, the reuse. One are shipwrecks, and the other ones are some terrestrial sites. I would say, in my opinion, that these are in two different levels, OK? Shipwrecks are the real evidence we might have. Because even in a bottling or a warehouse, if we can't find this reuse, it could be, you know, a reuse for a more regional distribution or more local based distribution. So we, I, I would put the shipwrecks in the first stage of, of our evidence. So that's pretty much it. Um, the other thing is that I like the place where you treat the prices of the amphora, you know, because the value is, is less. But I rather to see that from a different perspective. The fact that the, some of the written sources talk about the price of the amphora, even if it's a lower price, <laughs> it means that they had the price. So if, if they had the price, they might have been object of some sort of trade, reuse, or circulation. And I was going to put an anecdote from my childhood. I mean, I remember, and I'm sure you, most of you remember that. After Christmas, every year, we, we used to collect like you know, empty bottles of champagne or keva or, or at home sparkling wine, <laughs> I would say and sell it again to the scrap market. So we could out, you know, take out some, some money out of there. As for the future, for the future, uh, you know what ERAU does. Uh, so we will be there if you are aiming for a European project or any other sorts of project. I think we can contribute, of course, in, in, in the economy of the Roman and late antique period through pottery evidence, but also in what we do, which is uh, the archaeometric characterization of you know, of materials, provenance and technology, because I think it's fundamental. We should not forget that. Even if we talk about contents, we should not forget fabric you know, and origin in, in terms of provenance. Also, because of we do organic residues, so Alexandra Pech is now with us at least for the next five years, which is a very good news, by the way. And we will be there. I think we will be there trying to do a systematic study of uh, inorganic uh, characterization and also a systematic study of uh, organic contents in those amphora for which we don't know what was the content and also for those types of amphora that are still very uh, problematic. I think we, we, you mentioned this thing this morning. We need much more analysis for a large series of amphora and try to solve what the content is. So the discussion is yours, not mine, and you have Ted Peña here that will be answering your, answers, your questions, and I hope that we'll have a fruitful.
discussion. Yeah, I, I uh, obviously trying to capture this vastly complex topic in only 25, 30 minutes meant that I had to be very superficial and, and skim over all sorts of complexity, the sorts of things that were demonstrated so mas masterfully by uh, Miguel Beltran in the first talk, and uh, again by Andre Chernyan in the second. So it goes without saying that, that I was grossly simplifying things, but just for purposes of, of discussion. Um, uh, so when I alluded to the need to nuance our interpretation of pitch, I'm aware of Dario Sintas' recent article where he discusses that, and Michelle Bonifay, of course, has, has done some very important work in pointing out how it's not a straightforward issue at all, right? And it's, it's somewhat difficult to understand. So um, for me, maybe the thing that, that bothers me the most is I'm not certain that I've captured the correct categories. Uh, on the one hand, the, the points you raise about principal content and and irregular content and things like that. Perhaps that is a, a not useful straitjacket. But the type A, type B distinction, again, is uh, maybe that's not really the correct one. Is it, uh, for instance, um, you might have large-scale reuse of amphors but for local distribution, as, for instance, the author of the recent treatment of Villa B in the Mutile Limpero catalog, Michelle and Rome, has assumed. She, she assumes that all of these amphors are meant to distribute wine in the in the Adria Pompeianus, for instance. I don't know on what basis, but it, it's not impossible. So I have some anxiety about whether or not there's some better way to try to recognize what I think are significant behavioral distinctions in the sorts of, of operations that, that we're thinking about here. So maybe someone else can, can capture that more, uh, more effectively. Um, those are the comments I would make for right now. Any others? Sorry, maybe I, I misunderstood. Uh, I wanted to know what is your argument to um, consider that some of the amphoras uh, of the Culip 4 uh, cargo was reused? Well, according to Vieto, and I don't know the actual containers, which I, I guess Kukwell does, is that um, they all have signs of being, in very irregular ways, stoppered, which does not seem compatible with the argument that they're containers being used for the first time. That effectively is the argument, isn't it? That's it. Uh, I've not seen the evidence presented in detail. In fact, that one of the things I strove to do without any success was to find photographs, for instance, of, of precisely what the stoppers look like and what the next look like. So that's why I didn't make that higher leap in my paper, because I, I frankly don't know the evidence, and your question is an entirely correct one. So I, in effect, can't answer it. The, the, the evidence is that all the all the Dressel 20 of Kulik 4 are stopper with uh, fragments of amphora, yeah. but not very well cut, not even cut in, in, a, in a regular shape. They are even, some of them are even quadrangular, you know. They are just put there just to avoid something to, to get into the amphoras, but not even the, the liquid to get out. So that's why they interpret that as a reuse of, of the Dressel 20. And that's why the Kulik 4 has been interpreted at the end as a, as a ship that goes from the port of Narbona towards the area of mm -hmm. Catalonia, right? Not, not, not from the Vatican directly to the area, but as a, from a main port, which is Narbonne, to a secondary port, which would be Rosas or any, any area in, in Catalonia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Over there? Too many hands? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Just one small comment that uh, uh, that is linked with uh, the comment of uh, Michel this morning uh, about the, the Cabrera 3. The so-called Lusitanian amphorae from Cabrera were not from Lusitania, were from Betica. And so all the interpretations about uh, what the ship means, it's wrong because, because it's not so, so much different origins. And, and I would say, 
that maybe those African amphorae we should look at the fabric because <coughs> it seems uh, very, very <coughs> compact, uh, uh, regular cargo. I would say that everything is from Baitica. But the fact that they're Baitican doesn't change the fact that there are distinct levels of heterogeneity, homogeneity between the two groups, though, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't change your interpretation, but not <coughs> what I see as that fact. Uh, of course, I agree with you with the Spanish emperor, but I think you go too far with the African emperor. <laughs> and I think that most of them are African according to the fabric. I didn't see the, the emperor, but the, the stamps, of course. And I was very interested by your interpretation of the Cabrera Free uh, Reich, because with André Chernia, we had a completely um, different interpretation. Uh, <laughs> We thought that the, the, the emperor, uh, African emperor were uh, transported to, to Cadiz and then retransported towards um, where we don't know. But it seems that we have a large series of uh, such uh, wrecks with uh, African and Spanish cargoes and uh, scattered uh, mostly in the Western Mediterranean, of course. And, uh, even around Corsica and uh, um, Sardinia, that could imply that the, these uh, boats were um, sailing towards uh, Rome or something like this. So it's really important your distinction between uh, short distance and uh, long distance because I think it's the clue of our problem. Of course, uh, the reuse of amphorae is obvious, but uh, the, uh, did this uh, reuse uh, mean that everywhere we will find uh, um, reused amphorae, e even for the interprovincial -provinci trade? Uh, that's the, the point, uh, from my point of view. Um, and uh, concerning, uh, so if we, we find that the, the African amphorae of Cabrera Free and the other uh, African amphorae of the other wrecks, uh, with uh, Spanish and African cargoes were reused. So it's really important because we have something, uh, a, re, a large scale re reuse. But we, we have to, to search more and to prove this interpretation. And uh, on the other hand, I think that Grado is a short distance uh, trade uh, evidence from my point of view. Uh, last observation concerning the inscription Taur I think we will discuss uh, about this uh, after tomorrow because we, we have some uh, other interpretation. Yeah, could I just respond to some of that? I mean, it's uh, the publication of Cabrera, the Cabrera wreck, in fact, has that nice graph where they show various other wrecks which have that same combination of, of, of amphoras in the cargo. And as I recall, several of them are off the coast of Sicily, even. And so it's clearly this complex and, in a certain sense, repeating set of operations that's producing that, or, or one or more, I suppose, perhaps I'm being a positivist, that's, uh, that's creating that, uh, that combination of things, which I don't claim to understand. Yeah. Let me say that I enjoyed uh, most of the definition part uh, we need definitions in the amphora studies. And uh, after several months of reading about the content of amphoras, I was quite sure that under the terminology reuse of the amphora or uh, secondary use of an amphora, we all mean the same thing. Uh, what I would like to ask uh, has to do with the presence of uh, Tituli Picti or Dipinti, as they, they were called. Uh, you insinuated, uh, I think, that uh, you can find Tituli Picti also in the use type A of amphoras. And I'm asking this because uh, amphora studies are dominated by the idea that every specific shape of an amphora, and not only in the Roman times in general, is connected with a specific commodity. So if this is so, why do we need the Tituli Picti? And, uh, you could consider then that uh, if you have a Tituli Picti in the type A uh, uh, reuse, uh, use, then it means that the content of the specific amphora is not self-evident to the market. 
And uh, a second question uh, connected with the first one. Uh, I don't know where the data of the West Mediterranean, but uh, for the East Mediterranean, we miss completely Tituli Picti in uh, shipwreck contexts, at least not in salt water. Uh, is this meaning anything? Thank you. So the, the first question, though, was why in type A reuse would a titulus pictus be needed because the content should be self-evident from the form of the container? Well, I think that gets to the question of, now this might be throwing it open too widely, but the function of titulus picti to begin with in general. Uh, and I think what I'm arguing here is I think that there are obviously varies from case to case, but I think the research at Pompeii is showing that for many cases, they're more widespread than, than people have assumed, they're more common. Um, but I don't know that I can, I can answer your question other than to say that. May I um, add the... Um the hint that um, I just um, sent two articles concerning the, my considerations concerning the function of Roman Tituli Picti in German and in France, so <laughs> not in English, but um, there I discuss the function of Tituli and why they are written on the amphorae. So that could, this could be helpful. Um, I, I will talk about this uh, later on. I suggest uh, that we could focus, you know, on the topic of the speaker you know, <laughs> because if not, we are moving and talking on very, very interesting things. But we will have a specific uh, lecture this afternoon on inscriptions, you know. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any traces of official uh, sealing of amphorae, empty amphorae? Shell sealing amphorae? Uh, sealing empty amphorae. You know, in Greece, in Delos, it, uh, it, we have some accounts, official accounts of the priests, of the magistrates, of the Apollo uh, sanctuary. And after the banquets, they sell the Canadian amphorae. We have even the prices of the empty amphorae. So it means that they will be reused for a purpose. We don't know uh, to whom, but we have even the prices of the empty amphorae. Of the selling yeah. of amphorae. Yes. So they drank the amphorae during the banquet, and after, they sold them. Not it was about 170 before Christ. Well, uh, some of the papyrological evidence, for instance, that papyrus I showed, which is late, yes. AD 566, yes. uh, that, in fact, relates to the acquisition of a, a vast number of amphorae is to be turned over to the vine dressers clearly for the hmm. packaging of the vintage. Uh, so there are instances like that. Uh, the other famous example, which is somewhat related, is what CL 6, what is it, 3685, the famous customs list from Rome uh, about the, the, the various <laughs> sportuli that uh, possessores, people paying their, their tax in kind in the form of wine, uh, they had to give various sorts of, uh, of payments to various officials who were involved in receiving the wine. Um, there, there's this curious and debated note that uh, it says the ampullae are to be given back to the possessor. Mm. Um, and uh, I've argued that that actually means that the wine itself is being brought in Lagoni, small flat bottomed amphoras, and it's being transvased into barrels. Um, that's a minority opinion, though. Uh, someone like Domenico Vera, for example, and most of the scholarship believes that the Ampullae actually are, are uh, a degma, a little sample bottle or something yes. like that. But to me, it makes no sense that you would really care who got that mm. little sample bottle back. So thinking about the value of things, I can induce that inscription mm. as well. And answering to your uh, 600 AD papyri, you have also other papyri of the mid-3rd century BC in Z Zenon archives. Mm -hmm. yeah. So where Zenon... Counts uh, all the empty Rhodian and yeah. Foray, Canadian and Foray, lesbian and Foray, and so on. That to was collect the first them. version of my paper, but I cut it out. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but 
In fact, uh, how do, could we explain the Monte Testaccio? How to explain it? Yeah. Oh, well. Or oh, this broken on for a yeah, I've, unsolved. I've, I've tried to explain it as, as being an instance of the, the massive production of emptied amphoras for which there aren't particularly good reuse applications. Um, in other words, a large globular amphora can't be used for many sorts of, it's hard to break up, it's heavy, it's hard to carry, uh, it's not as useful as cylindrical North African amphoras and things like that. And so I would argue that there was some preferential discard of the Dressel 20s and probably a lot of the African amphoras that were being emptied there were making their way out for other, all kinds of reuse applications, often being broken up. But I see Michel Bonifay has the answer. Thank you. <laughs> In fact, uh, that leads to the question I was aiming for, which was, can you explain to me, you probably have already written about it, but the process and the difference between what happened at Testaccio where they empty the oil, uh, which is supposed to be for, for all the, the people that, that receive it. Mm -hmm. There's only one place, which is there. They empty the oil. People must come all over from Rome to go and get that. I don't understand. Later, I think, when Later, you have the mensai uh, for people to, to, to go to with their, with their other amphorae to collect the oil. What happens in the first? I think that's later, isn't it? It's a yes, late it is. Roman that, thing. We have no evidence for that earlier than the early fourth century. So, and that's probably due to the, what happened to Testaccio when it, it changes yeah, yeah. Uh, and the uh, uh, Aurelian Wall is, is built. But what hap how, how, are things, how do things work in the early period? I never f understood this. I, I, I don't understand it either, and I, I can just say a couple of things relevant to it. One is that uh, some of the Dressel 20s, I guess, have the Epsilon titulus on them, right? Which often, uh, I believe, indicates amounts of oil that have been removed in, at the level of the Hamina, which is what half of a sextarius, I think. It's a very small unit. And so that points to some sort of very small scale keeping track of oil. They're allegedly made at Testaccio, I think is the interpretation. And so there's a, a very small amount of, of evidence that speaks to your very good question, but more than that, I, I, how, how the mechanics got oil from, it, it transvased out of those amphoras to the consumer. Uh, I've written a little bit about it, about, um, you know, there's, there's a relief from Ostia, which uh, I again, somewhat positivistically interpret as a photograph in the inside of, a, of an oil shop. Uh, but it's a, it's, I, I can't answer that question, it's a good one. It, it implies that, that those that got all this oil in various parts of Rome, which is a large place, had to go there and it, it seems Either unworkable. Either that or some antecedent system for the dis mm. dis disbursement of it. It was decentralized, we just don't have evidence. Mm. Right. But you're right, uh, <laughs> it's a good question, I can't answer it. I don't think that the consumer went to a testaccio to buy his uh, two pints <laughs> of oil. It was, it was sold to retail merchants in notable quantities. And another aspect is that uh, from the Trian or Hadrian uh, onwards, the Anona distributed oil. And uh, Christol's interpretation of the diffusores or the area is that there were intermediaries between the merchants and the Annan. They were delegated by the merchants to be their intermediaries. So they may have been the ones who, uh, from the amphorae arriving in Rome and discarded on the Monte Testaccio, worked with the Annona who organized the distribution in several districts of Rome. when they have these mensa in, in specific places, that's a change, isn't it? Sort of a change. It's 
that's something I also commented on, the fact that they are found, they are clearly not non, they are non anona amphorae, which are arriving uh, in people's house, houses. Yes, but they can be sold. Well, that's another matter. <laughs> but it's physically, they can remove them and take them. They, they, they are those examples in people's... Well, those in the Magna Mater, for example, have been moved physically and end up there. So, yes, they are moved. But are, I was asking really about the ones which which were not removed. about just the Grado wreck, that the composition is very interesting, which, which are there, because the so-called, you mentioned that uh, Grado one, we have several names about this type. Uh, we know the recently that it produced uh, Istria, this type. And uh, after the second century, they produced fish sauce, because there are several amphorae uh, with different fish sauces and the others it's interesting how they collected for the other African and others how they put together where they take it from the the other fish sauces or, or others this the composition is interesting how they was able to so many African and other amphorae together the thing that puzzles me, which again maybe, maybe uh, Kuko can answer, is that reading both the texts of Auriemma and Toniolo that regard these, those are the only ones I know, that it's not clear whether all the Tripolitanians were stoppered with Tripolitanian sherds and all the Kennesaw's 19s with Kennesaw's 19 sherds, or whether all three classes were mixed and matched across the three, uh, you see what I'm saying? And, and that would be interesting to know. And, and from the language of the publications I've seen, it's not clear which of those two instances is in fact the case, which would tell us maybe a little bit more about, or allow us to imagine in a bit more detail the dynamic of, of the, the reuse of these samphors. So that much I can say. And maybe someone who knows the evidence better can, can uh, answer that question. I think that uh, the um, Grado shipwreck is very mm, important because uh, it, it, it is the evidence of, of, a, of a one problem that I'll talk uh, about tomorrow. The problem is that the uh, Adriatic area produced uh, a lot of fish. We have uh, documentation uh, and uh, so on, but uh, we have only the uh, Grado one amphora result to contain fish and so the reutilization activities, the reutilization operation were very, very frequent. And so we have this archaeological evidence of a Grado shipwreck that can be used for uh, historical uh, things. Just a, a brief observation. Can you infer from, from uh, your typology that uh, uh, the amphorae with, uh, which were primary used were, uh, and the amphorae for the secondary use, the second category was, from the economic point of view, inferior to the first? And uh, also, if they were, uh, the secondary uh, reuse uh, of amphorae, uh, I think that uh, it makes sense uh, that this uh, trade to 
to be for, for, for a very short provincial, uh, local distance. That we have uh, uh, in the Athena and Agora and the store, um, an Amphara which was uh, for wine and it, uh, later uh, has a second uh, inscription uh, indicated it was for grain to be sold uh, uh, on, on the market with a certain uh, price. I'd say a couple of things. I wouldn't say it's inferior, just different, and not so much the topic of the conference. And so that's why I chose not to address it. If you look at the rabbinic sources, for instance, it's very clear that the Havit or Haviyot were all the time being reused for, and even made new for, for storage in some cases, something that, that I, uh, I glossed over. One other point I'd make is another point I had in an earlier version of the paper, which I took out, is I think that I was thinking I'd be attacked for what might be a naive representation of, of honesty in, in, in the Roman world. Um, uh, but what I would say is this, I would think that people were probably more inclined to work the margins of suitable reuse in the context, for example, of state mobilization of foodstuffs. That mm -hmm. is, if I'm a possessor and I'm obliged to turn over a certain amount of wine, I would say, well, the hell with it. I'm just going to stick it in any kind of container I have, and if they don't like it, too bad. Uh, mm -hmm. The market would be different. And so I think there are these distinctions, and distinctions yes. that are kind of interesting. Yeah. For instance, there are uh, various kinds of African amphors built into structures in Milan in the 5th century AD, which presumably were originally, although, again, Michel Bonifay may be able to correct me, uh, either oiled or fish products containers that have titulated picti that showed they were being used to hold wine and grain. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this isn't an association with some sort of ecclesiastical mobilization yes. of food mm -hmm. stuff. So these are all these complex possibilities that, that I wasn't able to address in yes, uh, my now 50 minute long paper. Yeah, and the Grado shipwreck also uh, shows the same differences. Garu, which was uh, more expensive than the uh, salt fish, was deposited, stored, in, uh, transported in special uh, made amphorae for, for Garu. The, the uh, salt fish was uh, you know, reused amphorae. Thank you. Any other comments? I think that reuse is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Okay, so thank you very much to both of you. Um, we have to close the session because sun is nearly two o'clock. So uh, after lunch, we will begin with the amphora contents and shipwrecks. Please, uh, it's important to say that we had a lunch appointment in a terrace in the open air and it's raining. So what we have uh, decided, because it's the only possibility, is that 20 people, just 20, can come with me to the restaurant but inside, okay? Not outside. So please, no smokers, okay? Mm -hmm. And all the others can remain here in the faculty. In the first floor, you can go to the restaurant and just showing this, they will give lunch for free, okay? Do you understand? So 20 people have to stay with me. All the others go to the faculty restaurant, which is in this building. And we meet here again at four o'clock. Thank you very much. If I may again, uh, if someone doesn't have his accreditation, just wait for me outside. I will come and give it to you for the ones who didn't have it. <laughs>